NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the biggest storylines with comments from key guests in the college and high school NIL space. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome into another Thursday pre-draft edition of the Strictly Stripes podcast. Muhammad Ahmad, Andrew Gillis, and Mike Nislik here with you. We are exactly two weeks away from draft day, uh, a time that I have said time and time again on this podcast that I'm excited about, but we're going to kind of put a pause on that real quick because uh, it's Joe Burrow Day, which you can unofficially say is you know how we've handled you know the last couple Thursdays on this podcast. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the biggest moves, uh, not just you know with the Bengals, but within the AFC North and across the league that have a significant impact, you know, for Burrow next year and, you know, why they're so significant, kind of compare and contrast some of the different moves that, you know, me, Andrew, and Mike have in mind. Before we get into that, though, I want to remind you guys to make sure that you sign up for Cincinnati, um, excuse me, the Strictly Stripes Cincinnati Football Newsletter. Uh, It's in your inbox every morning with all of the latest news and reporting and uh, analysis from me, Mike, and Andrew. You just go to cleveland.com slash newsletters and click on the Strictly Stripes Newsletter again. It's free, take seconds to sign up, and it's well worth it. Uh, but jumping into it, guys, so, so, you know, we've seen a lot in free agency. I think we've seen pretty much most of what we're going to see up to this point in free agency. We saw it in the Bengals in-house. We saw it, you know, with the Orlando Brown signing. We've seen a lot of action across the AFC North, including the Odell Beckham signing. Um, not that it has an impact on Burrow, but, you know, there's been a lot of movement. There's been a lot of traction in the last month, month and a half, and really across the league overall. But if you just kind of sit and think, you know, about moves from across the league, what are some moves that you think of where you think about it and you're like, man, that's going to have a big impact on Joe Burrow next year for better or worse. You know, whether it's some team grabbed a guy that will be a problem for him or a team lost a guy that will make life easier for him. You know, where do you think free agency really kind of helps Joe Burrow out going into 2023? Well, I don't know if this has necessarily helped him out. Uh, you know, one of the first things that I that I think of is losing Samaj Pirine. Um, you know, you're you're losing a guy who he he was a really good pass blocker. He was a really effective pass blocker. Uh, I think we we can all agree, and it all kind of you know the evidence kind of aligns to say, hey, look, you know, Bengals are going to add a running back in the draft. I, I don't think that that's necessarily crazy to say. So, kind of whatever that swap is going to be, but. You know, again, Samaje was a really good pass blocker. So I think, you know, losing him is, is really impactful because, you know, you've done so much work to the offensive line uh, in the last two off seasons. Uh, this off season, obviously, you have the Orlando Brown signing. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think that, that that's kind of one under the radar. Samaje Piran, uh, the, the, the departure of Samaje Piran is under the radar in the, in the way that I think, you know, you, you kind of have to figure out another plan for, for a third down running back. Um, you know, and then I think just as you kind of look across the division, I mean, teams that you're going to play twice, uh, I think you could make a really good argument that the Steelers defense, which was already, you know, pretty good, got better. Uh, their linebackers were pretty bad, but, you know, they also added uh, Patrick Peterson this offseason. And, you know, I know you lose Cam Sutton, but Patrick Peterson had a really, really nice year in Minnesota. So I think that, uh, you know, anytime you have a defense that already has, you know, a TJ Watt and a Cam Hayward and can really get after the quarterback, Anytime you add a defensive back like that, I think that that really kind of changes the game. So, um, you know, those might not be the two biggest, but I think those are at least on the podium in terms of uh, kind of moves that impact Burrow. Yeah, I think we should say, though, that, you know, I think if we were to rank, you know, the most impactful moves, Orlando Brown would be obviously the number one. uh, Absolutely. um, You know, on everybody's list. So we're kind of ignoring that in the sense that, you know, look, that's that's number one. Obviously, that's going to affect him on every play. Um, that that's the biggest deal. Uh, but I think what Andrew said about looking in your division is sort of, um, you know, the the first thing where you go because obviously you play those teams twice, um, and in this case, you played the Ravens three times last year. And I think their free agency sort of, I, I don't know, I kind of call it a debacle. 
uh, I think is the That's you know, a compliment. most Im- impactful um, thing beyond that. I mean, obviously you have uh, Lamar Jackson requesting a trade. Um, the two sides don't seem anywhere closer to uh, working out that contract situation. They haven't really signed anybody other than Odell Beckham Jr., um, which, you know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they have a lot of whole whole lot of holes on that roster. They let basically everybody go in free agency that they had, um, you know, that were free agents. Uh, a lot of those starters, I think we talked about it, at least a half dozen um, are gone. And so, um, you know, they kind of hit up a cap situation, fell, fell into a cap situation that's not uh, very good for that, you know, franchise, uh, especially in the short term. And, and they're sort of stuck in limbo with the Jackson thing. So I think that's sort of the, the first thing. Um, another impactful move that – um, if the 49ers um, are interesting. Obviously, they're one of the top teams uh, in the NFC. They play the Bengals next year in the regular season, and obviously they're going to be one of the teams uh, that you figure you know could come back around um, and play them again. You know, in, in a possible uh, Super Bowl, they signed um, Hargrave and and upgraded that uh, fantastic defense. Even you know signing the top available you know free agent defense defensive free agent, I think is a big deal. Um, you know, at the end of that contract, they might not be thinking that, but in the short term, I think in the next year or two, uh, that's going to be really imp- impactful. And every win is going to matter uh, for the Bengals in terms of uh, the competition for the AFC, for that home field, those top two seeds. And so uh, I think that's another move that will impact the Bengals uh, next year, obviously impact the Burrow next year because he's going to be going up against Hargrave uh, in the middle of that defensive line. So those are the kind of the two moves I've seen as sort of, uh, you know, obviously Bravens is more than one move, but impacting uh, Burrow and the Bengals. Man, you took Javon Hargrave out of my mouth because that's one that I was going to say. I think, and honestly, credit to the 49ers. Like, I think, you know, they had the best defense in football last year, and they're going to have the best defense in football again next year, if not better with a signing like that. I mean, you get a guy like Hargrave, he just played in the Super Bowl with the Eagles, you know, and you have – you know, the team that he beat to get to the Super Bowl, the 49ers, well, you might put them over the hump with a signing like that. And, you know, it's funny because uh, the Niners came to Cincinnati not this past season but the year before, and you wouldn't have thought that at the time because both teams were, like, kind of 7-5, and 7-6. and six. But, like, that was almost a Super Bowl preview. You know, if the 49ers had won the NFC Championship game against the Rams, it would have been Bengals 49ers in the Super Bowl. It was almost Bengals 49ers in the Super Bowl this year too if – you know, both teams didn't lose their respective conference championships. Like, that's how close these two teams have been to meeting in the Super Bowl. I think that's definitely something to keep an eye on because, like, I mean, if the Bengals do get to the Super Bowl, if they're going to be a contender, which they will be, and they actually make it to the big game, like, you better believe that there's a good chance you could play the Niners. I know, obviously, their quarterback situation is a little bit weird because, you know, is it going to be Brock Purdy? Is it going to be Trey Lance, who we haven't really seen a whole heck of a lot of, but... I mean, regardless, Brock Purdy took him that to that NFC Championship game. So, I mean, with their coaching and with that defense, I wouldn't be shocked if they blow my mind and make another run where they almost flirt with a Super Bowl match with the Bengals. I think, you know, you go back to what Andrew said about the AFC North signings. I really think that, I mean, the Cleveland Browns defensive signings in general, I don't think you can just pinpoint it to one, whether it's Ogba Okwananko or, you know, Juan Thornhill, you know, or Dalvin Tomlinson that they got from uh, the Vikings. I know we mentioned them, but like just collectively think about this. Like the reason why the Browns were able to beat Joe Burrow uh, in their first four or five meetings against him is because of their defense. I mean, you already have Miles Garrett. You know, you have Denzel Ward who gave Joe Burrow fits. Um, you know, when they first played each other in 2021, not the first time, but that first matchup in 2021. I mean, Denzel Ward, Greg Newsome, I mean, and then you add Juan Thornhill, who's gonna elevate them versus what they had with John Johnson, who they released. And obviously, you know, you're probably going to lose your Davion Clowney. And so that's where you bring in Okranako from the Texans. You know, you've got a really good interior front, although Perion Winfrey, his future is going to be interesting uh, with the race, recent charges he had down in Houston that Mary Kay Cabot reported on. Nonetheless, I mean, that defense it's not even just going to be good because of those signings. I think another impactful move, I know it's not a free agent signing, but, they got Jim Schwartz. I mean, love or hate the guy, 
I think he's a good coordinator. I think he's going to do better than what Joe Woods gave them. So I really like the Browns free agent signings on defense. I like the Hargrave signing and in the sense of like, it's not going to be good for Burrow because it's going to make his life harder. But I think there's something to be said about, yeah, like if you're those teams and you're trying to beat Joe Burrow next year, pat yourself on the back because you, you know, you took a step forward in that direction. Um, but, you know, if you want to look at the opposite of, like, you know, where is Joe Burrow's life going to be better? I mean, I just think, yeah, like, defensively, the Ravens are going to be weak next year. Like, they might not bring back Marcus Peters. He's still a free agent. They cut Calais Campbell. And, Andrew, is Jason Pierre-Paul a free agent? I, it's a long list. Is he is he on the team right now? Uh, JPP? He's a, he's a free uh, agent. Know. He's a free agent. Like, what if he doesn't come back? I mean, that's two yeah, defensive I, I, I line right there. Even with Jason Pierre-Paul, but. I hear you're yeah, you're right. The, the Ravens did have a pretty pretty negative off season. Yeah, and I mean, obviously they still have Patrick Queen. You know, you you could flip that and say they extended Roquan Smith to a big deal. I mean, that's always going to be tough because I mean, Burroughs always had fits when it comes to like going against Patrick Queen. You know, who we played with in college at LSU. But yeah, I mean, outside of like dealing with their linebackers, I mean, they they lost Chuck Clark too, right? Or did they did they resign him? Uh, yeah, they, traded Clark. Cup Clark. they traded, they traded him. him. Yeah, they traded yeah, him. they traded That's him. Good. Yeah, he was gonna be he was gonna be a cap casualty because they uh, they have Marcus Williams and Kyle Hamilton, which I mean those are two really good safeties. Um, so uh, their safety, t- you know, it's it's funny their their defense is still pretty good. Um, you know, Kyle Hamilton I thought played pretty well towards the end of the year. Um, you know, Marlon Humphrey still a pretty good corner. Uh, you, you need you need uh, you need help at corner. You know, I think. If, if you were to go anywhere for the Ravens in the first round, it would be corner. But, um, I mean, their defense is still good, but they, you know, they did lose a lot. Yeah, I don't know why I was thinking he – I forgot he was traded. I guess there's just so much movement. I didn't realize that's how he got to the Jets. But, yeah, I mean, it's – I'm not going to say they're decimated because, like you said, they still got some, some chess pieces on that defense. But, I mean, you think about how much more confident and better Burrow's going to be next year – how much more used to like the cover two looks that they're going to give him that they gave him in that Sunday night game, which is why they beat the Bengals or part of the reason why they beat the Bengals. Yeah. I think the Ravens, yeah, they got a problem there. And I think Joe Burrow's like, will gladly take that. Um, but I feel like I'm just trying to think, I, I feel like there's some other moves out there that, that are just there that maybe aren't like the, they might not appear the most impactful on paper, but like there's some sneaky good moves that like might actually, you know, Hurt, not hurt, bro. Again, this is just based on like each opponent they're playing. But we'll just, I guess it's hard to say because we'll just kind of have to see once, uh, you know, the Bengals play their respective opponents next year. But I think those are the the biggest ones. I guess you could say, no, nah, this is this wouldn't affect them. I was going to say the Chiefs getting Joe Taylor, but I was like, that's going to help Patrick Mahomes more than Joe Burrow. So I don't know why I was thinking of that. But no, I think th- those are some interesting cases to be laid out. And I think you know, in the future, we can kind of flip this and do a podcast on, you know, what are the the biggest free agent signings the Bengals have done since Burrow got there. So in the last three years, like what have they done, you know, to help him elevate his game since he came to Cincinnati? I think that's a good talking point for next week. But I think, you know, it, you guys throw out some good scenarios there. I guess, the, you know, the, the one I'm questioning is the Patrick Peterson one. I think he's still good. Like he, he played decently. Well, I should say more than decently last year, but – I mean, do you, do you think, like, you know, he, Joe Burrow's going to have to, like, worry about him that much? I mean, because he's good, but he's not, like, all pro, pro bowl good like he was, like, five years ago. Like, I don't know, Andrew, do you think that's as big of a, a signing as it appears on paper for the Steelers? Well, I think, you know, it, it's when you compare it – or it's not when you compare it. It's when you add it to kind of what the Steelers already have. I mean, you know, the Steelers – the week one game last year in, in Cincinnati was just so weird. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, that, that you can almost throw out, but I mean, TJ Watt's really good and he's one of the best defensive players in the sport and no doubt you know, love Cam Hayward and, you know, you still have a good pass rush and, you know, their linebackers last year were pretty negative. So I think it's, it's kind of more of, Hey, they, they impact, you know, they're still really good and they impact the game at, you know, in the front seven. And when you have a guy like Minka Fitzpatrick on the back end, you know, I think that, um, you know, just kind of in totality that, you know, adding a guy like that, like, you know, if the Steelers didn't have a pass rush. If they didn't have this, that and the other. It wouldn't be as big of a move. But I just think that, you know, if you can kind of get Patrick Peterson another year or two, 
to kind of tap into to kind of what he was, or at least you know close to what he was, then uh, you know then the Steelers are feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, no, definitely, and I, I will never. Uh, downplay the impact of T.J. Watt because even with how many games he missed last year with the injury he suffered in week one, still played really good, and that's not going to change going into 2023. But, yeah, I mean, if you just look at, like, the Cardinals and the Jags, like, I'm just looking at other teams that the Bengals are playing next year, like, in the conference and out of the conference, and there's really nothing that, like, sticks out for me of those teams where I'm just like, oh, Joe Burrow better look out for. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're Jacksonville, like, uh, they would sign that one – uh, defensive lineman Roy Roberts and Harris, but like, I mean, that's not anything I'd be afraid of. But I will say though, the Jags defense with Trayvon Walker and Josh Allen, that's going to be pretty good next year. Cause I mean, that's a big reason why they had that stretch to get to the playoffs and Trevor Lawrence is only ascending. So that's going to be exciting, you know, fitting him in with Justin Herbert and Burrow and, you know, those top three quarterbacks. But when we come back, we're going to kind of shift things back in house to Cincinnati, kind of revisit the T Higgins conversation do the Bengals have a good shot of keeping him should they keep him what does it mean for this year's draft and beyond we'll talk about all of that and much more when we come back right here on the strictly stripes podcast thanks for staying with us on the strictly stripes podcast so kind of shifting gears back to cincinnati you know and to kind of connect this to a conversation we had yesterday we talked about you know should the Bengals entertain a wide receiver in the draft is that a need that no one is really talking about and we had some really good discussion on that for those who missed that episode you can tune in wherever you get your podcast we had that uh, on Wednesday and i bring this back up because uh, a really interesting article came out of the athletic um where one assistant coach who wasn't named uh told, I believe it was Jeff Hose, Jeff Hose, the athletic talking about the Bengals situation with T Higgins, Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, kind of keeping that trio together. Um, the onion coach basically said, if you're the Bengals, you draft his replacement now because good luck trying to keep him is pretty much paraphrasing what he said. Um, and I think that's interesting because, like, obviously, yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about it. You you do have to possibly plan for a world where there is no T. Higgins because, I mean, you're talking about shelling out a lot of cash for Jamar Chase, who could come in 25 to $30 million on a future extension that he can get next year. T. Higgins is going to want at least $20 million. And Lord knows, you know, how much Joe Burrow breaks the bank with what could be. I mean, I've talked about this and I wrote about it. Even PFF projected what could be the biggest deal in league history or the highest – you know, deal in the league right now. But I mean, is there a point there? Like, do, do you think we could actually see the Bengals like draft maybe as high as the third round and get like that Jaden Reed, get like that Tyler Scott and say, okay, we don't know if we can keep T. If we don't extend him this off season. We just might have to do this. Like, is, is that coach onto something? Or do you think that's just, you know, too premature right now? Uh, you know, I, I just don't think that, it, it, I mean, you know, the they can say what they want, but, I mean, Duke Tobin said they're not going to trade him this season, you know, or, or they're not feeling calls for him. So, I mean, I don't really think that part matters because, you know, it, it, they're not going to do it. So, in the short term, I mean, he's going to be on the team this year. So, I think that's sort of, um, you know, their speculation about, that doesn't make much sense in the world that like look they are going to this is what they've chosen whether it's right or wrong you could debate it but um t higgins is going to be part of the team next year and i don't think anybody thinks that that part um you know i, I think that that'll get them the most production out of any of the scenarios um it, you know obviously if you trade them and draft a wide receiver i don't think you're going to have as a productive of a receiving room as if you did have t higgins so um you know should they trade them uh, you know, I think there's a case to be made, um, but they're not, uh, or at least this year. And so I, I don't know what the future holds in terms of, you know, how they go about navigating this situation. Um, you know, they've, I, I don't think they've sort of clearly, you know, they said they want him to be part, but they haven't really necessarily committed um, to sort of a, a path going forward with a contract extension. But I guess we'll see here in the weeks to come. Because I do think it's going to be a situation to monitor. I mean, it really hurt Jesse Bates that he was playing with all that uncertainty. Um, and, and I don't think um, T. Higgins wants to do that either here going forward. Well, I wasn't trying to imply that he'd be traded. I guess what I was saying is like, kind of like how they 
the Bengals, you know, they, they picked Dax Hill last year, knowing that, okay, Jesse's probably out the door. Like, I guess what I'm saying is, do you kind of draft that replacement now? And you still have T in 2023, but you draft him knowing that we may not be able to pay him this off season or next year, even if you franchise tag him. Like, I guess that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Because you're right. I mean, he's he's not going to get traded this year. Well, if you do I think that, everyone agrees on if that. If you do that, you're planting a pretty clear flag of what you're you're not going to hold on to him. And I think that would lead to all sorts of problems in terms of, you know, how you know, you know, with his people and 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 you know him going forward. I don't necessarily think like if you draft a first round wide a wide receiver in the first round, it's pretty clear where you're going. Um, and I think that could really mess with sort of the chemistry and sort of the um, uh, you know, relationship with with him, and so I'd be leery of doing that. Um, you know, I I just don't think that that's a very good idea. Well, what if you can justify it and say Tyler Boyd is almost thirty and he's going into the last year of his deal? Does it look as I mean, bad you can at that it any, as any way you want? But I mean, I think people will know. I mean, you know, T Higgins is not going to take it any other way. I mean, I, I don't know. I just think, yeah, like, yeah, Tyler Boyd, yeah, you're going to try to replace him with a first-round pick. I don't think you do that with a third receiver. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, to me, um, I think it'd be a clear sign that they're going to, you know, move on from him, and I think that would um, uh, cause some ripple effects. I mean, you saw what, you know, the Orlando Brown deal did and how they've handled it or didn't handle it with Jonah Williams. Um, I don't think you need necessarily to do that with two players on your roster. I mean, this team has kind of prided themselves on having a very close locker room uh, with the coaching staff and the management and all that. And I, I think you're um, getting that those kind of steps would be something that would, I think, very clearly take away from that. I mean, I, I think maybe, uh, but it, it also depends on the kind of receiver that they take. You know, if you take Quentin Johnston, who is six foot three, and, you know, is kind of a bigger body. I think that that's a different conversation than, you know, if you take Zay Flowers, like if Zay Flowers is there and, you know, you're really high on him, he's five foot nine, 182 pounds. Like that's not a guy who's going to play on the outside. That's not a guy who, you know, you would view as a one for one replacement with, with T Higgins. So, you know, I, I think it depends. I think, you know, if, if you're, if you do draft a receiver in the first round, second round, third round, you're probably going to have, you know, some kind of some kind of thought process there. I mean, it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty cut and dry. What's going to happen that, you know, at least one of those guys is not going to be there in 2024. But, you know, again, I just think, you know, what makes this team so good is you have the quarterback obviously set in stone with Joe Burrow, but then also you've got war machines at wide receiver and with Jamar Chase and T Higgins and Tyler Boyd, and I don't know. I just think that if you add a, another receiver, I'm not sure, you know, that, you know, and hey, we're just going to run more four receiver sets instead of, you know, instead of three receiver sets like we kind of did last year where we had, you know, three receivers running back in a tight end. I just think you add, a, you know, you just put another receiver out there and you cause nightmares for defenses. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm not as down on the idea as, as Mike kind of seems to be. I just think that it depends on the receiver that you're going to take. Because again, if you draft a receiver who plays on the outside and, you know, is kind of that guy who appears to be a one for one replacement for T Higgins, then you've got questions. If you draft a guy in the slot, you know, a guy who's going to come in and be a slot receiver, you know, if, if you really like Jordan Addison, five foot 11, 172 pounds, you're feeling, you're, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessarily that means anything for T Higgins. I think that that means more for something uh, for Tyler Boyd. So uh, it, it just depends on who you draft, the type of receiver they are and kind of where you pick them, where, uh, where you can kind of read ahead into the future with this. But then why would, elaborate I, I on... don't understand that. Like, why would you keep Tyler Boyd then? If that was your plan, if you're drafting Zay flowers, there's no reason you keep Tyler Boyd, especially when his dead cap money is 1.4. You could save $8.9 million in salary cap money. But are you going to use that money though? Because his contract's up at the end of the year. So, like, if you're, are you going to use that money between the draft and the season? Because if you are, then I think you have a case. Like, if well, if yeah, you, I mean, you'd use it. You'd find a use for it. I think. I mean, you could. Well, it depends who's out there. Like, I mean, is the, I mean, honestly, you could front load an extension for T Higgins that way. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that. Oh, interesting. It, if you're if you're drafting Zay Flowers, I don't understand why you keep Tyler Boyd. Like if you're drafting Zay Flowers and keeping Zay Flowers, I think it's clear that you're not going to pay T Higgins. Like you're just going to leave your because you can't. 
mean, t- his salary is going to go up pretty quickly and then be, you know, cost prohibitive you know, as well. So it's like, I don't know. I just see it as um, uh, you can't, you've said that you want him on the team. And then if you draft his replacement, you're sending very mixed messages and those things can, I think, blow up in your face. I guess my and point. that's pretty much what happened last year. I mean, you know, they drafted a replacement for Jesse Bates and he missed almost the entire off season and all of training camp and most of the preseason. And, you know, at that point too, you pretty much knew this is it. Like we all knew going into 2022, like this is Jesse Bates' last year in Cincinnati. I mean, there was even the question of like, was he going to play? Like, would he just sit out, you know, not take the franchise tag and then just get his deal in 2023? Or, you know, does he play and take that risk? But, you know, he did. He bet on himself. It paid off. It worked out in Atlanta. But, like, that's the thing. You also have to consider, too, and this is the fact that people need to realize, Jesse Bates and T. Higgins have the same agent, David Mulugeta. I mean, you could look at other players that Mulugeta has represented, but you got to realize, like, Mulugeta already has history in these kinds of situations with the Bengals. So, like, I don't think it's a crazy assumption to say, oh, well, you had this happen with Jesse Bates. If you don't, you know, you don't come to a deal with Higgins like you couldn't with Bates and you slap a franchise tag on him next year. And like, let's assume they don't make the move this year. They wait until next year. You know, assuming Higgins is not extended this year, you go into 2024, you know, Tyler Boyd, whatever happens with him, that's separate. I would, I don't think he'll be back after this year because the Bengals, like I said, don't like to extend guys past their thirties, but it's 2024. You're going into the draft. Um, and you you draft a wide receiver first, second round, and you try to slap the franchise tag on T. Higgins, and then he's not happy, and then you have this back and forth like you had with Bates. I think if you don't make a deal this offseason, you know, and you almost are certain that Tyler Boyd's going to you know, walk in free agency or you're not going to keep him, then you could create a situation like that. So it's very interesting. Um You know, because like the one assistant coach said, he thinks that the Bengals, to kind of paraphrase him, he thinks that, Higgins is dynamic, but not so dynamic that they can't replace his, you know, value of production. Where I somewhat disagree is uh, is that if you're going to do that, I don't think this is the year to do it. Because if you do it this year, then, oh, yeah, unless you're going to release Tyler Boyd and find a slot replacement, then, no, that's absolutely going to blow up in your face. Because, I mean, you, you like like Mike said, if you draft his replacement, then that's pretty mixed messages from what uh, Duke Tobin was talking about at the NFL Combine. So, you know, I'm so glad you touched on that there, uh Mike, there's there's a lot of different th- ways this could go, but I, like I said, this year I do not see them drafting a guy in, in the sense that they're going to replace Higgins. If they pick anybody, I think it's like Andrew said, it's going to be, you know, grooming someone to replace Tyler Boyd after next year, or better yet, replace him outright if they cut him. Uh, if there's going to be anything as far as replacing T, that's all going to play out next year, depending on what happens in this off season. Just to wrap up with something fun, because you got to remember, as intense as this podcast podcast gets, you got to have some fun. I don't know why I didn't bring this up sooner, but I just saw that uh, Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, said that Angel Reese, uh, forward for LSU women's basketball, just won a national championship, made headlines for reasons beyond winning a championship with her excessive celebration. He said that she is the best player to come out of LSU. And he said specifically, best player male and female. So, and he's talking about himself too, because remember, Shaq went to LSU. He was a former number one overall pick in the NBA draft. So he's saying Angel Reese is better than me, better than a lot of other players, including Joe Burrow. So I don't know how much you guys follow college women's basketball, um, but is Angel Reese the best player to come out versus Joe Burrow or even Shaquille O'Neal? Because I mean, respect to Shaq for humbling himself, saying that she's better than him. But, I mean, I don't know. Like, Joe Burrow did a lot more at LSU. Like, he got a lot – you know, he got a lot more awards. And I understand football has a different level of fandom. But, I mean, objectively, I just think he did more as a player. Do you guys agree with Shaq? Well, I have no idea. Um, I I watched (laughs) – I watched LSU play one game this year, and it was the national championship game where they beat Iowa. Um, So the only thing, I mean, she won a national championship. Uh, She averaged 23 points, 15 boards. Seems pretty good. I have not ever once seen her play besides that one game, so I have no (laughs) idea. 
Wait, are you not a Maryland basketball fan? Because she used to play at Maryland. Uh, are are you a Terrapins not. fan? I am not. Uh, oh, I, have, I, you're from that I area. have a soft spot in my heart for for old Maryland teams. Uh, one of the first tournament I ever remember I've, I ever remember watching was the uh, the year Maryland beat Indiana. Um, Juan Dixon, Steve Blake, uh, they beat an Indiana team with Jared Jeffries. Really like Gravis Vasquez. Um, so I have like soft spots in my heart for them, but yeah, not not ever a Maryland fan. I don't any own any Maryland merchandise. Interesting. Mike, I don't know how closely you follow the sport, but I mean, like, what do you think of what Shaq said? You, you think she makes a case for being better than Burrow, or you think otherwise? I mean, dismissing it out of hand would be sort of disrespectful since I've never, I've not watched a single minute of her play basketball. So, I mean, I would assume that he's overstating it just to make, you know, headlines and just to say something interesting to spur discussion. But, um, you know, I. It would seem to me that she'd need to accomplish a little more to sort of be in that category. I mean, Shaq probably has a, you know, I, mean, I guess it was athlete. So, I mean, I guess he's not saying like most accomplished collegiate player, but um, yeah, I couldn't weigh in on that debate. It would be unfair. So as someone who kind of watched her this year, because, you know, I, I tragically went to Kentucky, which their women's basketball team, I'm not going to comment on that because this year was a dumpster fire. But I watched her a little bit because they, you know, they played LSU. And I mean, you look at it. I mean, I'll say this: obviously, she did a lot. Unanimous first team All American, first team All SEC. You know, SEC All Defensive Team. She was also All Defensive Team at Maryland. You know, where she played for three years before transferring to LSU this year. And I mean, she was the tournament's most outstanding player after they won the national championship. I mean, if I'm weighing against Joe Burrow, I mean, I, I guess the Heisman Trophy equivalent for her would be. The uh, the SEC honors, and then I guess what? He was the most outstanding player of that championship game they won over Clemson. So that's where they're kind of parallel. Um, I mean, she did also set the NCAA single-season record for double-doubles in the SEC single-season record for rebounds, which, I mean, look at all the records Joe Burrow set until Bailey Zappi broke some of them at WKU. Oh, by the way, I covered those record-breaking things, so that was pretty cool. But anyways, not about myself. Um I don't know, actually. Maybe Shaq makes a point because, like, yeah, I'm looking at these accomplishments and I'm like, you know, I don't even think Shaq set any kind of records like that. Granted, it was 30 years ago, but even then at the time, I don't think he did. So maybe it's headlines like Mike said, or maybe Shaq is like, she's got that dog in her. No offense to myself and no offense to Joe Burrow, but I'll give Shaq that. He's he's always a fun guy to listen to. One of my favorite players so, so to watch you do, growing up. Just, just so readers – Shaq was the player of the year in 91 and was a two-time All-American in college. So Yeah, and the uh, number one overall pick. I, I'm not saying he wasn't good. You just I mean, there's he didn't a... accomplish anything in college. Well, he, he, he didn't win a championship. He didn't win, like, a national championship is what I'm saying. He didn't well, win a title right, but or anything not, like that. Well, you didn't win a national championship. Player of he, the when year. he was there, right. <laughs> but that's when I'm talking about when he was there. But you're missing my point. I'm saying individually. None of them did this. Well, I mean, individually, though, you could say what makes Burrow and Reese up there is, like, they won most outstanding player of, like, their championship. So, like, they, you could say, carried their team as far as they did. Like, you know, why didn't – again, I'm not trying to criticize Shaq because, again, I, I love the guy. But, like, he didn't lead them to that national title game. I, I don't remember who else was on that team. That was 30 years ago, obviously. But you just, said just seeing if you want to be nit- – he didn't accomplish anything. You said he didn't do anything in his career at LSU. He was the player no, of the year in college. I didn't say that. No, good. No, I'm saying he did a lot. Like that's the equivalent of bro winning the Heisman. But I'm just saying if we're being nit 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 nitpicky, like Reese and Burrow were like outstanding players of a championship that they won. That Shaq didn't win. But let's be real. I mean, Shaq's in the Hall of Fame, so I'm not gonna like crap on him here because he's he's my guy. Uh, but stay with us because tomorrow we're gonna. Do something different that we've never done on this podcast, and we are going to do a live mock draft. We're going to literally pull up the PFF simulator, and we're going to do uh, round-by-round picks for the Bengals from 1 through 7, and we're going to do it in live action. So uh, we hope you follow along with us. It's, it's going to be a good one. But once again, for myself, Andrew, and Mike, I'm Muhammad Ahmad. We'll see you on Friday.